you are losing a lot of value if you can't make it. There's an enormous return on investment for any company that's paying a developer, a reasonable developer wage, and sends their developers here. I, I, I can't tell you how big of a mistake it is not to send someone to CBPCon. All right, I guess we can uh, get started. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today, we are going to talk about curtain patterns and how to use them, problems and solutions using curtains in a modern code base. Uh, before we start, something about me. I'm a software engineer building monitoring tools at Meta. I'm passionate about C++, and I wrote the book C++ Fundamentals. And in general, I like writing and talking about C++. So, what are we gonna be talking about today? We're gonna to start with the motivation of this talk, a little overview on some concepts that are needed to understand the patterns we are gonna talk about. And then we are gonna join a jump into the patterns. We are gonna cover lifetime, exceptions, RAII, and synchronization. And at the end, there's gonna be some conclusions. So, what's the motivation for this talk? C++ existed for 40 years, and many things have been tried, and many things failed. But some worked. And with this thing that worked, we build a knowledge that we use nowadays to write software that works. The introduction of uh, curtains brought a new pattern. And while the fundamental concepts of C++ are still valid, they change a bit in the way in which they are applied in a coroutine world. The goal of this uh, talk is to start building the shared knowledge of patterns that work in coroutines. Before we start, we're gonna look at a couple of things that we need to know uh, to understand the patterns. But uh, first of all, the important thing is C++20 introduced coroutines. And since then, there have been many talks, even at this conference, about this new feature. But a lot of these talks have been about the mechanism of the language, um, optimization that can be done with libraries, very cool applications on this new um, approach. For example, I had a talk in 2021 on this. But all of these talks are towards library implementers or are very detailed oriented. What about the big majority of the developers which are gonna end up using a crutin library to build software? They care about delivering value, not about building a new library on this new language feature. This talk is about them, is about us, that we want to deliver software using coroutines. So throughout the talk, I'm gonna reference an implementation of coroutines. In this case, I'm gonna talk about Folly. Folly is an open source library from Meta with one of the most mature implementation of coroutines that I'm aware of. And uh, the initial idea uh, was to also compare that with other popular open source libraries. Unfortunately, we won't have time for that. But the good thing is most libraries are working the same. And throughout the talk, I'm gonna reference which parts uh, translate to libraries, to other libraries, and which part don't translate as well. All right, so a concept that we want to um, cover before we start is tasks and executors. What is a task? A task is the object which owns the coroutine state. It's lazy in Folly, but in most libraries is lazy by default. Lazy means that when you create the task, no execution starts. The execution of the task or the coroutine starts only when you await the task. And task can be converted to be eager. The other key part is that it propagates the executor. So you get a task, you start executing on an executor, and this task is gonna wait for other tasks. All of these tasks are also gonna be executed on the same executor of the first one. For who's familiar with the locators, the concept is similar. It just propagates down the hierarchy. And finally, in Folly, tasks are sticky to executors. This means that when a task starts on an executor, is always gonna execute on this executor unless the task itself changes the executor. 
This means that if it awaits another task, which changes the executor, this doesn't leak into the original executor. This is unique in Foley. Other libraries don't do that, but they call out in their uh, documentation that you need to be aware of this leak. All right, let's see an example. We have a task foo, and the task is gonna print hello, and then it's gonna sleep for one second. And then we are gonna call this task. Here we can see that we call foo, we get a task, then we print world, and then we await the task. Let's see, so this could print either hello world or world hello. So can you please all raise your hand? Okay, amazing, so it works for everyone. So now I'll ask you to vote whether you think it's gonna print hello world or world hello. So who thinks that it's gonna print hello world? Raise your hand. Okay, and everyone that thinks that is gonna print world hello, raise your hand. Okay, big majority got it right, and exactly it's what, uh, it's what is gonna happen. Uh, we create the task, but it's lazy, so no execution starts. We print world, and then we uh, print hello. For the executor part, uh, it's very simple. It's basically a queue in front of one or more threads. It executes synchronous functions, or just regular functions, and uh, it can be uh, implemented with multiple thread or single threads. The interesting thing is that coroutines with the compiler machinery are translated to a set of synchronous functions. Here we have the task foo, and uh, we start uh, creating a variable, we modify the variable, and then we wait the send. We are gonna get back some bytes, and then we do error handling on that. When this is converted by the compiler, it's gonna be split into two synchronous functions. The first synchronous function is gonna execute the code until the first suspension point, the co-await, and this is colored in yellow. Then the second uh, synchronous function is the one that's colored in light blue. You can see the co weight is partially colored in yellow and partially colored in blue because the compiler machinery is, a part of it is executed at the end of the first synchronous function and the other part is executed at the start of the synchronous function. And uh, when this task is uh, executed, someone is gonna start it on an executor and this means that the first synchronous part of the function is gonna be put on the queue of the executor. In the meantime, there's a thread which pulls from the queue and executes these synchronous functions. So at one point, the thread pulls it and starts executing it. It's gonna get to the suspension point, which is the end of the first synchronous function, and some work is gonna be scheduled. After a while, this work is gonna complete, and it's gonna schedule the second part of our curtain into the executor. And again, later point, the thread is gonna pick it up, execute it, and complete the task. All right, with these fundamental concepts, we can jump into our patterns. We're gonna start with lifetime. And with, when coroutines were being proposed, there were a lot of concern about the lifetime of uh, the coroutines. Lots of people were worried that there would be problems with reference and uh, accessing uh, invalid memory. In practical terms, this hasn't been a problem in the code base that I've been working on. Uh, the secret here was to use structured concurrency. There is a link here in the slide, but the fundamental idea of struct structured concurrency is that you need to join on the work that you start in a scope. You don't leave the scope without joining the work. And this guarantees that you can reference with pointers or references local state without a risk of a leak. The other aspect is sometimes you're not gonna be able to do this, especially if you're building some abstractions um, that you're gonna use throughout your code base. In that case, ASAN actually works very well. And the good thing is that these kind of abstractions are quite rare to write. So it's quite easy um, to dedicate effort to them, have them well tested, so that you make sure that you're not make, introducing any memory problems. 
But the key thing to make sure that everything works correctly is to know that member functions which return coroutines implicitly capture the this pointer. To understand this, let's play a game. And to play this game, we need to use some code. So here we have our struct bar. It has a data member called data, and it has a, a function member, which is called foo. Foo is gonna sleep for one second and then return the data. We also use another function. This is a free function, multiplied by two, mal2, which takes a task, awaits it, and returns the result multiplied by two. All right, the game is that this. I'm gonna show you some code, and you're gonna clap if you see a problem. Let's do a test round. Can I get an applause? <laughs> Amazing, so we validated that clapping also works together with raising the hand. Let's get started. This is a test run. I'll show you this code. Yes, correct. We, we have an error here because we are accessing the front which is uh, of a venti empty vector, and this is a UB. And I showed this code. Yes, this is a bit pointless, but it's technically correct. All right, let's jump into our um, code. Uh, we are gonna have a timer. I'm gonna start it when uh, uh, we are ready to decide whether you want to clap or not. Um, but here we are gonna have a bar and then we call the member of the bar and then we call wait and we start a timer. Yes, so this one is correct. There is no problem. We just get the correct result. In a different one, we have bar, we call foo, we assign it to our task and then we await the task. No, this is actually correct. Uh, we are simply getting the task. The task represents the state of, the, of our coroutine, uh, but bar is alive, so everything here is still alive and there's no dangling uh, reference. Let's look here. We create a bar, we call foo, and we assign it to a task. And then we await the bar. <laughs> correct, so you didn't even need the five seconds to think about it. This is a dangling reference, and the reason is that bar is, construct is destructed at the end of the full expression. And so, since task didn't start any work, because it's lazy, when we await at the line after, it's gonna access the um, member, uh, which is not valid anymore. And what about this one? No, this was a good, uh, good choice, it's correct. And the reason is uh, that bar is still a temporary, but the temporary is destroyed at the end of the full expression. And by the end of the full expression, the coroutine has terminated executing because we co-awaited it. So this is an example to show that it's not necessarily that an R value reference is a problem uh, with lifetimes. It depends a bit on the context. Now, we'll start using also our multiply to function. Uh, do you see a problem with this? Uh... Correct, this is, uh, works well. We know we still have bar alive. Uh, we just have an interaction in who's gonna be awaiting uh, foo. What about this one? <laughs> Correct, this is an error, and the reason is that we are calling bar is our temporary, we get the task, we move it inside mal, but mal also is lazy, so no work is gonna start. Once we start co-awaiting the mal result, this is gonna co-await the original task, but bar now is destroyed. And what about this one? Oh, ignore A should be bar. Uh, here it's, uh, I right. assume A is bar. Right, this is the same example as before. There's just a, an extra line direction. All right, so in our shared knowledge that we want to build, we have a new entry and it's, uh, we need to keep an object alive until all its methods have completed. And when does this concretely happen? Well, this is quite common in loops. For example, you want to start many tasks in parallel, so you're gonna put them inside a vector. But here you can see that the task is called on foo, and foo is inside the loop uh, body. 
and this is going to access food which is the, uh, invalid. There are several solutions to fix this, but an option could be to have a foo also inside the vector so that the lifetime uh, lasts enough. Another situation when this happens and is uh, a bit more tricky is with lambdas. So we need to remember the lambdas are actually a struct with an operator call. So in this code, we are, we are creating a lambda and calling the operator, but then the lambda is destroyed at the end of the function. When we move in 2D, we are accessing the local state, and this is an error. The solution is like we saw earlier. We can either co-await immediately the lambda, because it's going to last for the lifetime of the full expression, or you can assign a lambda to a local variable and then invoke that local variable. Of course, if your lambda has no state captured, that's also fine, because there's no reference to the members of the structure. Another option is to use coinvoke. Coinvoke is a function offered by the Foley library, which makes sure that the lambda lives for the duration of the task. All right, so we add another entry to our knowledge. Uh, we need to ensure that lambda objects are kept alive. And I would argue that this is nothing new. Uh, we just need to know that the task captures the this pointer. If you see this code, which has a vector with a tuple containing a, an integer reference, and we put inside the index, I think many code reviews would spot that this is an issue. Once people are familiar with the fact that there is this reference, it's easy to catch. Another aspect with lifetime is scheduling the background. So here we have a foo, we schedule some work in the background, and then we co-wait. Do you see any problem? So I see some nodding, and the problem is that by the time do other stuff completes, we have no guarantee that bar has completed, and that could result in accessing uh, invalid state. This is a big no-no. We need to join the background, uh, the join the work in the background. And uh, to do that, we can, for example, get a handle to the background work and uh, make sure that we await it at the end. This is also useful if you want to surface potential exception or error, which are um, raised by the background work. Sometimes you want to start a lot of jobs in the background, and you don't want to tr keep track of each of them. For that, async scope is a class offered by the Foley library, which basically keeps track of how much work is still ongoing in the background. This is how you use it. You can schedule work into the async scope, and then before you leave the scope, you call join, and that blocks until all of the work scheduled into the async scope has completed. So another aspect is always join the work before you leave the scope. And, but anyone saw a problem with the code we showed earlier? Let me go back to it. Um, what if do other stuff throws? We are gonna leave the scope but we are not going to join. This is a problem. So this brings up to the topic of exceptions. And uh, you might be tempted to uh, use a try-catch. You check and you call the join inside the catch. But this actually doesn't work. You get the compiler error. It's not possible to co-await inside a catch block. What we can do here is instead capture an exception pointer, and then we can, we can check if it was set and co-await outside of the catch uh, block. Another alternative is to use co-await try. Co-await try is uh, another function provided by the Foley library. And what happens is that it wraps a task and gives you a task which, when co-awaited, gives you back something like an expected with either the value of the task or the exception that's been thrown. So it guarantees that this task is not gonna throw. And then we can check if there was an exception, and if so, we join. And then we can access the value. Accessing the value rethrows the exception if it was set. So to do a sync work in a catch block, we can capture the exception in a wrapper. And there are libraries that can help us make this easier. 
But C++ has the big functionality that's our AII that does the cleanup for us. So here it looks like we are taking a step back um, compared to regular um, C++ without coroutines. And unfortunately, this is a bit of a mixed story with uh, coroutines because we don't have async uh, uh, destructors. But there are two different solutions. There is uh, one for class hierarchies and one for automatic variables. For classes, what we are gonna use is the async cleanup pattern. Basically, you define an async cleanup function and uh, the parent, so anyone that inherits or uses a member in a class, or the owner, for example, local variables, needs to make sure to call it. Let's see an example. Here we have foo, it has two members bar in the async scope, and then it defines a cleanup uh, uh, function. And this calls the join and the cleanup to be done uh, concurrently. Cleanup shouldn't be throwing because conceptually we are basically implementing a destructor. And uh, it's very useful to have a Boolean to keep track of whether the cleanup has been called or not and validate it in the destructor. This is gonna help you find out the situations in which you forgot to call uh, cleanup. Unfortunately, this is a bit of manual work. The good thing is that this doesn't happen that often. Um, so it's easy to have tests to uh, ensure that this is being called, uh, but it's not ideal. The story to handle variables which are inside scopes is a bit worse. Uh, we need to call uh, cleanup, and it's similar to the join that we saw earlier. What worked for us is to avoid exceptions using co-await try or having try catch blocks throughout, throughout the function and with testing. Again, the flag that uh, warns you uh, if you forgot to call the cleanup uh, is helpful. But this, unfortunately, is, is not a success. Uh, there's no good uh, solution. There's a couple of things we are investigating, but uh, at the moment, uh, this is what we are stuck with. So for RAII, we want to use the cleanup pattern to join a scene work uh, in classes. And you might be te uh, tempted to say, this is bad. We have destructors. I'm just gonna call blocking weight in the destructor. Blocking weight is a function which is common in throughout the libraries, which starts some coroutine work inside a synchronous scope. But this is a problem. You're gonna end up with deadlocks. And why are you gonna end up with deadlocks? The reason is that your thread, which is executing the function, which is running the destructor of your class, is gonna be blocking the thread of the executor. After a while, whatever you're waiting for is gonna complete and schedule the work into the executor. But the executor is not advancing. The thread is blocking waiting for the work. So now you have a deadlock. This is an example code which is uh, gonna show you up. Um, you can reference it later in the slides. So the other thing is don't use blocking weight, especially in the structures. And this takes us to the topic of uh, synchronization. This is another big question that people had when we were talking about coroutines, and the question is, is this needed? And the answer is uh, no, if there's no shared access. So if you have a coroutine which has some local state, and then it's the only thing that's accessing that local state, even if these are rescheduled on different executors or in different threads of the same executor, it doesn't matter because the executor takes care of synchronizing this. So you don't need synchronization. It's different in the case of shared access. If your core team is executed on a single threaded executor, you don't need synchronization because it's the same thread executing all the code. But if you instead use multi-threading, um, this can uh, end up, uh, it, this requires synchronization. And the reason is that here, for example, we are calling increase by one and increase by two in parallel. And if you're running a multi-threaded executor, this could run the two functions at, in two different threads concurrently. And then clearly here you need to protect uh, A. So should you protect it? In my opinion, yes. It's very hard to guarantee that your function is never gonna be executed in any multi-threaded executor, so it's better to be safe. And if you need to synchronize, what you can use? Well, of course you can use atomic uh, variables, so in that case, that could work. Uh, but otherwise, you can use mutexes, either the regular mutexes or the coroutine supporting mutexes. 
The important thing when talking about regular mutexes is that you must not hold them across suspension points. This results in deadlocks. Additionally, it's also UB um, if they are resumed on a different executor because you need to lock and unlock on the same thread. But if you hold across suspension points, you're not guaranteed that they're scheduled on the same thread. You, might be, you are rescheduled on the same executor. And, um, but why would you use them? If you have small critical sections, you might end up choosing um, to use them. Or if you need some advanced feature, for example, a lock that can be upgraded, or you need to interact with non-coroutine uh, code. And um, a good way to do this is to use Synchronized. Synchronize is a class that comes in Folly. It has some data and the lock. And you can provide a lambda, which is going to be called while the lock is held. This is useful because if you call coAway there, you're going to get a compiler error because the lambda is not a coroutine. And this makes sure that you're not using uh, coAway across suspension points. The other thing is using uh, uh, lock guards is quite risky because it's very easy to have a lock guard and then forget about it, and you call co-await. And at this point, you're going to end up with deadlocks. So do not hold regular locks across suspension points. And for the Coroutine version, they work. They work very well. And the nice thing is they support RAII. And the reason is that unlocking the mutex is a synchronous operation. And this can be done in the destructor. When you use coroutine uh, locks, you might still need to access the protected state in the destructor of the class. And you should be protecting it with the lock. But the destructor cannot co-await a coroutine, as we said before. Here, you can use try lock. Try lock immediately returns control to the caller if the lock, um, and telling whether they acquired the lock or not. But because you are in the destructor, nothing else can be, nothing else can be holding the lock. So you're guaranteed that try lock is going to succeed and you're going to acquire the lock. And this is the way in which you can access shared uh, state, which is protected by a coroutine lock in the destructor. So you can use uh, coroutine mutexes, including um, guards, and you can use try lock in the destructor to access state pro protected by a coroutine uh, mutex. So, in conclusion, we saw some pattern about things that we can do and things to avoid with coroutines. We built some shared knowledge about these patterns that we can apply in our uh, code bases. And uh, with this talk, I invite all of you to also share your experiences and what you find out working and not working using coroutines in your code base. And finally, hopefully together, by sharing what works and where we find gaps, we can work together to find solution and potentially evolve the language to fix this and get to a state where C++ using coroutines is as effective as C++ that we've used for the last four years. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. I think we have one minute and 55, if you want to do questions. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you talk about async destruction, and you have this cleanup class, and you recursively call it. Yes. But is it an anti-pattern, then, to use shared pointers with classes that need async cleanup? Because at some point at the top level, you have to manually call that cleanup function. Yes. Um, this is the part when it uh, gets a bit complicated. When you're handling the lifetime of classes which have this cleanup, you need to make sure to use to call a cleanup. Uh, what you could say is, oh, you just write a deleter which calls cleanup, but no, you cannot because the deleter is not asynchronous. And you could say, I'm going to use blocking weight uh, to call the asynchronous work, but then you get in the deadlocks. So um, in general, in our situation, we never needed to have classes which have cleanup that you start in shared pointers. Normally, the lifetime is well-defined and is in a scope. Uh, so we didn't face that uh, thing. I know that in Foley, there are some pointers which does call cleanup, but I don't know the details of, uh, of how that works. And I, I don't know experience with that. Uh, but yeah, it's a, unfortunately, there's no very good uh, solution for that.
Any reason why you can't use a scope guard to do the cleanup automatically with our AII and a coroutine? Uh, the scope guard, uh, I, I mean, imagine where you basically provide a lambda, and this lambda is going to be called when the scope guard is uh, um, destructed. It's the same problem with destructors. Uh, this is a synchronous operation, and you need to, if you need to co-await, you need to be able to, you need to be called in a coroutine scope, basically. Um, and so there's no place to co-await. And again, you can use blocking weight, but then you go in the deadlock situation. Hey. Um, I ask you to elaborate on using stat move on uh, stat move uh, task on co waiting while co waiting from the first glance uh, yeah it looks like a uh, weird construction uh, so I'm sorry I'm told that the session is over uh, thank you very much I'm gonna be here in the hallway to take other questions but uh, thank you <laughs>